the the topics come up a lot for me with clients and just in general uh, post COVID, how the stress and the isolation has compounded the pressure within relationships, within homes, and how often I hear uh, that people feel like their partner treats them with contempt or their children treat them with contempt. And the reason I linked respect and contempt is an obvious link between the two. And what I started off with was the specific definition out of the dictionary. And I won't go into that in a big way, it's printed in the article, but I was struck by the contrast between those two. Uh, deep admiration for something or someone uh, based on their abilities or what they do deep respect or beneath consideration, not worthy of a thought, contempt, the definition of that is brutal. Uh, and in my mind, there's like a, a vast geography between those two, but the real person who suffers out of it is the individual who's got the contempt running. My experience in my life is when I've had contempt for someone in my life, oftentimes they aren't even aware. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but it doesn't seem to touch them as much as it poisons me. And you bring that into a primary relationship and it's probably one of the most caustic elements that a relationship can endure or work through. So that's the general area that I was going with the article is, you know, the pole between those two places. Certainly there's people that deserve contempt, but probably not as many as we shower out there. Um, it tends to be an inner process, at least for me. Uh, and it's, it's poison for me. Now, I end the article talking about a story about remembering who you are. And I think that's part of the medicine that's available looking at this and where contempt grows within us as an individual. It's partly remembering who we are. Do you really care to be, choose to be bitter, angry, uh, resentful? Uh, sometimes all those things may be appropriate, but for how long? To live in that place is incredibly corrosive to me. Well, in the conversation we had last week, you know, you, what I said to you was, <clears throat> whenever contempt knocked at my door, when I felt contempt for somebody else, I had such an aversion to that level of, I mean, I want to use the word rage, but that sounds too loaded. I, I think it was more, it was closer to disgust. It's about as close as I could get to my my reaction or even my, my my response and um i never i could as i said to you i never could quite understand um when i was first introduced to the term contempt i never quite understood it i only begun to understand it when i was in a situation with a couple which i i don't need to go into the details but I was really struck by how contemptuous the wife was, how disgusted she was in relation to her husband. Mm -hmm. And when I left that environment, the, 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 the kind of toxicity of that, it's almost, I felt like it had contaminated me. That's mm -hmm. how, that's how I experience contempt. So this kind of combination of 
disgust. Uh, you know, I, I want to use the word rage, but rage is something so much more obvious, you know, screaming and shouting at somebody. Yeah, maybe it's more like a silent rage. Exactly. It's an, it's an inner, uh, could be an inner rage. Well, <clears throat> I have to agree with that. And, and of course, that would be passive aggressive, but it would be such an extreme example of passive aggression. I see contempt as passive aggressive, quite frankly. Uh, oftentimes it grows not only because of stress or like I said before, isolation, too much togetherness. Actually, it grows from a breakdown in communication. Uh, someone else doesn't hear you. Uh, I'll give an example. So I had a work relationship with a man who was chronically late didn't follow through on his commitments. I could not count on him or trust him in any way. Yet circumstance demanded that we work together. And I gave it a try. He gave it a try. We weren't a good fit for each other whatsoever. And it got to a point where whenever we came face to face, it ended up being a shouting match. And I really disliked working with the guy and had committed to a project, so it was forced to. What I came to was, you know, I could obsess over what a jerk this guy was in the working relationship and come up with various different strategies to undercut him or whatever. Basically what it came down to is I had to set boundaries, real firm boundaries, and I had to speak them not just harbor resentment inside my own head. That's what was making me sick in that relationship with him, is I'd go away and obsess over the fact that he was an hour and a half late. And he'd already moved on. Uh, it was me that was hooked. And so I had a choice in that circumstance between continuing to chew on that contempt, which I think oftentimes couples do in primary relationships rather than speaking clearly what's going on or setting boundaries or limits around what they're willing to tolerate or not. They go silent, resentful, and make themselves sick. Look, it, 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 you know, it raises some <clears throat> interesting thoughts for me, Snake, because um, if you think about when I first introduced the concept to you and the title that I introduced was Toxic Love, mm -hmm. one, the way I was looking at it was from the perspective of relationships. And in a previous podcast that you and I did together, you, you widened it. You, you went outside of the kind of intimate relationships. And, and as I listen to you now, and I feel quite sad even when I think about it, is um, the contempt a child must feel when mm -hmm. a parent is contemptuous of them, where a child has no power, but mm -hmm. actually experience it as shame, humiliation, abuse, mm -hmm. but because they're so young, they don't even, they don't even have the language or even the awareness mm -hmm. of, um, the level of toxicity that they're exposed to. So it, it, it kind of feels like it deepens the conversation for me. And of course, I can personally, I can relate to that. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably why in my own journey, whenever those feelings of contempt knocked at my door towards somebody else, mm -hmm. I had such a radical aversion to it. And there was a conscious, a conscious decision not to embrace that, take that on board because of the effect that it would have on myself. But looking at it from the perspective of a child whose parent is contemptuous of them, I wonder whether that child becomes contemptuous in their intimate relationships, adult relationships with either their own children or their spouses or their relatives or even strangers yeah no i totally agree i think absolutely and not always obviously 
But you think about those role models, we're emulating our parents, good or bad. We're picking up social and behavioral patterns through absorption constantly. And if that's what you know, that's the water you swim in, uh, of course, as a child, you're going to pick that up. But it, when you think about it, too, a primary caregiver showing contempt for a child, that can't help but leave a mark. Um, because the parent is also the character in the child's life that's all about survival and sustenance and safety. And if you go back to the definition, if that character approaches the child as beneath consideration, uh, that's pretty harsh. And unfortunately, to a greater or lesser degree, because we have that power position as parents over children, how often do we say, no, you can't do that because I said so. It's a real minor form, but nonetheless, it's a dismissal of the child and could fall into the category of beneath consideration. I find that part of it fascinating for both its subtlety and how common it is, whether it's workplace, family, children, but it's so incredibly common. You know, one of the, the stealth weapons of contempt too is sarcasm. And, you know, some people use it as a weapon, uh, some as pressure relief, but it, it falls into that contempt category as well, or can. Do you, do you, do you, because as, as I'm listening to you, I'm wondering whether gaslighting actually falls into that camp as well. And in fact, I, I know it does. I do, of course, do you know? yeah, I absolutely think so. I mean, if you think about gaslighting being convincing someone else uh, that they're confused or insane or that there's something wrong with them just to screw with their heads. Uh, that seems like an act of contempt. So just to, I'm curious because I'm trying to formulize it within the context of intimate relationships. And earlier on, you you did talk about boundaries, uh, disrespect for boundaries, lack of boundaries. Um, you also spoke about how not using these words, but the idea of how when we experience people not listening to us and not valuing, respecting us, there's something about how contempt seems to be birthed out of that experience. And I'm just thinking, you know, from the perspective of a relationship, intimate relationship, how people, how couples, same sex, different sex relationships, how couples can be able to possibly identify what those hotspots are so they can also address it in a way that the contemptuous person is able to hear that and i'm just thinking about and i did explain this to you last week i was just noticing in my intimate relationship um how my girlfriend or I think probably ex-girlfriend right now um, came across as impatient mm -hmm. and it was in the impatience that I experienced or I had a sense of contempt mm -hmm. that wasn't really being expressed other than through the impatience and I'm just thinking about whether you know you can talk to that as well because it's often in the impatience that we experience of others that contempt 
might be birthed or is birthed. Yeah, I think another identifier that fits right along with that is I've told him a thousand times, why doesn't it change? Uh, I've said what I want a million times. Uh, there's a stall in the communication, both in being heard and oftentimes in terms of speaking. You know, I've told them a thousand times, I'm not going to tell them anymore. And they go dark, they go silent. And the distance starts to grow between the couple and the communication erodes even further. So, you know, one of the places you can poke a finger in that is, are we responsive when our partners ask, say their perspective? Are we present in those moments and actually hearing or lost in our own desires and wants and frustrated and angry because why should I listen when they don't? So there's an action component to that, a response maybe, an acknowledgement of what's going on emotionally with your partner that's neglected and leads to contempt. And I mean, what you're raising, I think, is contempt breeds contempt. Uh, it definitely grows on itself exponentially, yeah, because once that communication and the resentment begins to build up and people go dark and stop talking honestly to one another and are angry, uh, to just, I'll speak for myself, to justify my position, I've fortified my contempt. Just, just say a little bit more about that so I can understand that. Um, I think to a certain degree, it's self-protection and justifying my position. You know, if I'm feeling contemptuous, I'm also feeling sick inside, heartbroken, disappointed, feeling let down, and making a judgment that it's someone else's fault. And it may or may not be. But fact is that illness is like a virus and it keeps growing within me to justify the posture that I've taken, that this person is beneath consideration. So in, in a way, you're also talking about a sense of betrayal. It could be feeling betrayed, yeah. So in order, in order for <clears throat> contempt to, to be fermented, if that's the correct word, um, it does take two people to be passive aggressive towards each other? Not necessarily because, uh, you know, it, it's probably the wrong road to go off, but there you're talking about shame, contempt for self. So it doesn't necessarily take another person on the outside. Um, we can have contempt for, you know, why didn't I work harder? Why didn't I achieve more? Why am I not? pretty why i mean there's countless different ways we can show contempt for ourselves as well but then wouldn't you then suggest based on what you're saying that what i do is the contempt that i hold for myself i also project that onto the other absolutely you know and it's not that clear because some people earn contempt too but do they earn contempt which makes us sick or is it a prompt to set appropriate boundaries and be clear with your communication. Uh, you know, it's not just being irritated because you're not feeling heard. It's being effective. You know, it's like, pick up your damn socks. I've told you a hundred times. I can be angry about that or I can insist. This really disturbs me and I want you to hear that. And I want you to act to remedy the situation. If that doesn't happen in a primary relationship, and it's not easy, but if it doesn't happen, it certainly leads to dysfunction and toxicity within the relationship. You know, Snake, it kind of does raise a question for me. And <clears throat> as you give me that uh, example, I think, oh my God, I wonder whether 
I was contemptuous of my own mother. Mm -hmm. It wasn't overt as such, it was passive, it was passive mm -hmm. aggressive. Um, and I remember as a, a mature adult, I was in Israel at the time with my mother, and his mother is also a therapist. She said to me one evening, she said to me, have you ever considered that you might, your mother might have special needs? Mm. And instantly the light came on. It's like, of course she has. But you know, there's something like the, the alcoholic who is functional. Yeah. There's something about people who have special needs might be very low down on the spectrum, but they still exhibit those behaviors. And one of the things that I describe in my own experience with my mother is that I spent years and years and years trying to fit her into my own psychological profiling. She was one of those individuals that I just quite didn't understand because of her behavior. But as soon as my son's mother said, have you ever considered your mother having special needs? The light went on and my energy towards her instantly shifted. Yeah. And my heart instantly opened up mm -hmm. and I was able to connect. Mm -hmm. But then I think it was too late because she was yeah. already in her I think in already in her mid seventies mm -hmm. and she was a very difficult woman to understand. So, you know, when we talk about contempt, I'm thinking, Oh my God, I wonder, you see, I don't think I exhibited contempt in the same way, but I was certainly passive aggressive right. towards her and um, impatient with her mm -hmm. and a similar, um, and caring. A similar experience recently, Michael was, uh, uh a very difficult individual, let's just say that. And someone took me aside and explained that they're on the autism spectrum. And, you know, my, what the hell is wrong with this person and they're terrible to be around, shifted, bang, like that. I mean, still have appropriate boundaries with it, but an, a, a bit of empathy came in. And that's, I think, part of the, 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 the medicine around dealing with contempt too, is you really almost have to disassociate yourself from another individual emotionally to build contempt. A remedy to that is empathy. Uh, if you can understand and have empathy for an individual situation, it greatly reduces the contempt. And do we do that with our primary partners? Not that often. You know, can I put myself in their shoes? Well, sometimes, sometimes not. And it seems odd, too, because the person we live with, the person we sleep with, we probably know the best. There couldn't be a worse place to nurture contempt. You got the goods on that person. You know them better than anybody else. So you know where to poke where it would be sore. And fold in passive aggressive behavior with that. That's a terrible combination. I can't see how a relationship, you know, can thrive in an environment like that. And it's so common. You know, I'm sure everyone listening knows an example of this as well. Well, you know, I was just thinking of a book that you once upon a time introduced me to by Caroline Baker. Do you remember the name of that book? Mm, I'm not it's, sure. It's to, do with the Rapunzel, it's, it's to do with the Rapunzel archetypal myth. Uh, in fact, I asked you recently about it and you, you were able to remember the name of the book. Oh, I think you're talking about uh, in Women Who Runs With the Wolves. No. The skeleton woman story. No, it's to do with with Rapunzel, where the, the hag does a deal with the family. This woman is trying to give birth to a child. And eventually the hag from next door says, look, you'll have a child, but as soon as she turns a certain age, I'm coming to collect her. Oh, do you remember yeah. that? And yeah. basically, um, if, if I remember correctly, it had to do with why women nag 
They don't nag just for the sake of nagging. They nag because they want to be heard. Yeah. They scream and shout because they want to be heard. They want to be listened to. They want to be valued. They want to be respected. They want to be appreciated. And I mean, I'm, you know, this, of course, is, is not specifically women, but men as well. Yeah. And so there is something to be said about one of the reasons that contempt emerges, coming back to what you are saying earlier on, is when we don't feel that our primary needs are not being met. And, you know, if you think about it in the context of the work I do, when it comes to anger, we tend to become really angry with others when they don't meet our primary needs. Yeah. And what we have to do is we have to articulate those needs. I need yeah. to be able to say to you, you know, I hear in, just in your voice, I'm hearing contempt and I'm not comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you being a lot more patient with me. Well, I appreciate you becoming aware of your tone of voice when you communicate with me. And let's mm -hmm. see if we can find a way to resolve this. So it comes back to this idea of the way that we set boundaries and the way we articulate our needs by yeah. recognizing what our needs are and then, of course, expressing them. I yeah. think that that can be there's, profoundly transformative. There's an awful lot of static in the air around this, too, because um, another example, and it fits for men or women, being contemptuous of the other gender because of previous experience. I mean, how many women I've talked to who have a particular attitude towards men in general? It's a global attitude and it's dismissive and contemptuous, but it's not necessarily based on their primary partner. It's based on a, a, a cultural impact that they've suffered from the time they were young girls uh, and valid oftentimes. Uh, but nonetheless, it's still poison, uh, poison for the individual. Uh, I counseled quite a few couples and it wasn't the opinion they had of their spouse. And this goes for men or women as much as the opinion they had for the opposite gender. So we carry a cultural posture and, and becoming aware of that to a certain degree. Uh, am I painting my partner with a label that's global or specific to them? Certainly has an impact on whether they feel heard or communication flows being dismissed as, well, of course, that's because you're a man. That feels contemptuous to me. Yes, I am a man. I'm also an individual. Can you hear that part of me? Not just the overall man identity label. But then it, 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 you know, it this brings in a whole new dimension to this conversation, which is also around how within the context of our relationships if i have unresolved issues with the opposite sex they're going to come out as contempt i think that's what you you yeah. suggest yeah and it's it's about being sensitive to that and it's also about being aware of that mm -hmm. because i'm just thinking about situations that i found myself in where somebody would demonize me for whatever reason mm -hmm. and then i'd also have to remind them that i can be kind and supportive and caring and loving and gentle Mm -hmm. also be generous and loyal so mm -hmm. when you when you hold when you hold th that extremity it means your ability to see me is not accessible is not mm -hmm. available and it does go back to what you were saying earlier on around empathy and compassion i mean mm -hmm. you use the word empathy but i think it's a combination it's a combination of the two empathy and compassion and that's hits right into that remember who you are when i'm full of poison and contemptuous and angry or rageful those are all real emotions i'm experiencing them um but if i stop for a minute and remember my values around like you say compassion empathetic whatnot and fuel that part of me, remember who I am. 
I really can't tolerate being contemptuous uh, and its impact within me. It's not congruent with my values to create an environment within myself that's toxic. And so it may not lift immediately. It's not an, uh, an instant solution, but it comes back to how much, how aware are you of your own biases, uh, the impact, how accurately can you read your own emotions, and how can you do that with a primary parent, a primary partner or child? Uh, you know, my values don't support being contemptuous towards children. <laughs> it supports being kind, instructive, patient. I have other values, but I forget who I am and stray into this place. And, you know, it's, God damn it, be quiet. I've had enough. And that's not congruent with who I am. At those points, I need to remember who I am. But then I think first you need to know who you are in order to be able to remember. So then what are you suggesting that in that moment of contempt, we lose a strong sense of who we are? Yes. We need, we need to be reminded or I need to remind myself. I think that, I need to remind myself more often. But wouldn't you then also say that it would be part of the other person's responsibility to actually name it for what it is? You know, you're coming across as impatient. You're coming across as unkind. You, you're treating me abusively, disrespectfully. I think it feels like it, 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 it need, there needs to be a balance between who I'm being too contemptuous towards. And it also means that the other person has to take responsibility for that, but they first of all have to identify that they've been contemptuous. You know, I'm, I keep coming back to this idea of toxic love, how people remain in these relationships where the relationships are so toxic. And the only reason that they're there is because better the devil you know than the devil you don't, for yeah. one, or the terror of actually being alone for another. So how we compromise our own integrity Mm -hmm. how we compromise our own values. And I think, you know, when you use the word, the word value, I think there's something really significant. When I go against my own values, I also have to deal with the guilt and the shame of my behavior, yeah. which then tends to, it, it tends, it feels like it tends to, um, to feed the angry wolf inside of me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another part of that too is uh, uh, feeling desperate. Uh, you know, a lot of people stay in those toxic relationships because of financial reasons or children or not having the opportunity to move someplace else or break the pattern. There's all kinds of ways to get stuck in that. Then it and raises. The so sickness can, can continue. Yes. But then it does raise the question around self-esteem. Yeah. Yeah. And so many things, uh, communication. Uh, when you were talking earlier, I was thinking, well, to confront and say, it feels like you're being contemptuous towards me, uh, appropriate or not, it's accusatory. And it's putting my reaction on another person, and it may not be true. More important that we own our own stuff in those partnerships, rather than being confronted on them. In other words, being more proactive around that is, you know, I know when I'm feeling contemptuous, if I'm proactive and come at you and say, you know, I'm really, uh, disappointed. Uh, I'm really uh, losing respect for you. And I want to know what that is about me. And to begin a dialogue around that. Is it true? Is it not? What if it's not true? Is it just my emotion or my reaction, historical or, or in the moment? 
all of that needs to be sorted through. And it just underlines the importance for whatever relationship we're in, whether it's with children or primary partner or business, how important communication is and how much it depends on our self-knowledge, our self-awareness. And so to avoid contempt, we really need to have large helpings of that. To recognize well, ourselves when we're feeling we're going to that place and speak to it rather than deny it. Look, I, I'm, I'm going to have to agree with what you're saying. And, you know, in the work that I do, I, I often say to people, you never want to start the conversation with you never, why don't you just should, what's wrong with you, that's really bad. Because actually, you can potentially come across as shaming and blaming and contemptuous. Mm -hmm. It's much healthier for me to be able to say, well, actually, you know, my experience of you right now is that you're impatient. And when I experience you as impatient, it either irritates the hell out of me or I find myself feeling scared and sad and hurt. Yeah. So it's always much healthier, as you know, to start the conversation by being able to express my own feelings. Mm -hmm. And then it creates space and an opportunity for the person to respond accordingly. Yeah. And otherwise, it tends to be, sorry, it to be reciprocal. It, yes. And otherwise, if I can just finish what I was saying, otherwise it can potentially turn into a dogfight. Yeah. Yeah. And then, sorry, but, just say that again, when you're talking about reciprocal. Yeah, it's a reciprocal relationship. Uh, that's what I strive for, is that in that place, both people are attempting to be authentic and and express the feelings that they're having or the difficulty that they're having and that the other one listen and that that switches. Well, then how do you respond to that? And an honesty, it takes tremendous trust. I mean, I was going through a rough patch in a relationship years ago and went and saw a therapist and the therapist suggested Rather than get into a dogfight, uh, identify a pillow. Who's ever holding the pillow is the one speaking. The other one has to listen. Well, get home, a pillow's identified. The woman that I was in relationship with said her piece, grabbed the pillow and walked out of the room. That doesn't work. <laughs> you got to have, pass that pillow around, not just hog it. And that's another hole that a lot of couples fall into is, you know, one is, uh, is not participating. It's all about them. And the reciprocity is incredibly important. If you're going to go into an emotional place like this, and not get into a dogfight, then both places need to be expressed and heard. Maybe the heard is even more important. You might think, how do you telegraph to your partner when you've really heard what they have to say? That's an important part, that witness that I, I hear you, I get it whether the action might need to be ne negotiated to remedy the situation one way or another, the initial step is, no, I really get it. And it's safe to bring it here. It takes a while to build that safety too and trust. If I go back to, you know, that cultural meme of all women are, all men are, if that interferes, it erodes any possibility of that truly hearing one another too. And as individuals, we need to be aware of those triggers within us. That's self-knowledge. It helps make that honest communication take place. If I'm reactive and reacting rather than listening, it's going to go to a bad place and we're going to just miss each other. And then, of course, it... it... You know, as I listen to you, it also reminds me of this idea of, of uh, resilience, mm -hmm. emotional resilience, mm -hmm. in terms of how we respond. 
when somebody's being contemptuous. Yeah. And are we going to respond with contempt? Mm-hmm. Or are we going to respond with empathy and compassion? Yeah. Help the other person to recognize the effect and the impact that their comments or their behavior is having on me or the individual. Yeah. And then on the, in, in that respect, it's about how do I communicate my experience in a way that they can hear rather than to retort with more contempt. Yeah. I think that's part and parcel of what's, what we're talking about here. So within the context of emotional resilience, it does suggest that the person has to find a way of being able to clearly communicate their feelings mm-hmm. as well as clearly communicate their needs and their wants, which mm-hmm. of course is something we already do within the context of our anger management programs. Yeah. And you, know and, what I, you know, there's another piece to this whole thing too. And some, uh, you know, old thing I picked up years ago and it's, you have to be willing to ask for what you want, fully prepared not to get it. Willing to accept that you might not get it. But if you go in thinking, I'm not gonna get it anyway, you're definitely not gonna get it. But to ask for what you want and prepared, whether you get it or not, that you spoke it, and put it out there cleanly and felt heard, that goes a long ways, really goes a long ways in a partnership. Look, the, the question that gets raised for me, you know, how, how you know, based on what you're saying, and I, I want to be neurotic about this because I'm, everything that we're talking about, it still feels like the love itself is toxic, which is paradoxical because if it's toxic, it's not love. Mm-hmm. And I'm just thinking somebody who is in a relationship where they recognize that the love no longer exists because of the contempt, using that terminology. Mm-hmm. But what do, what do we do? What do we do next? And often, you know, what I notice within the context of the couples work I do, I mean, individuals are very aware that the, the love is no longer there, but they're terrified for so many different reasons. You know, partly it has to do with low self-esteem, partly it has to do with finances, partly it has to do with stepping outside of their comfort zone, mm-hmm. partly it has to do with really being alone. But but what it kind of signifies and symbolizes to me, Snake, is when I feel so weak and I feel so fragile and I feel so scared and alone and confused, I then turn that contempt onto myself. Mm-hmm. And then of course, it reminds me of the workshop we did the tyranny of perfection, mm-hmm. how I then shame myself, how I then tyrannize myself. Mm-hmm. At the same time, tyrannizing the other person. Yeah. Uh, at what point? You know, I'm just thinking about listeners, uh, at what point, and I imagine there'll be listeners who will be curious about well, what do they do next? Mm-hmm. And I'm curious to know from your perspective, at what point do they draw the line? Do they have to be crippled with so much pain and suffering before they literally cut the umbilical cord and then separate? Or do they just endure the toxicity and the suffering until you know the day that they die or the day that they get terribly ill or the day that uh, they finally realize that the relationship itself has no no future. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could speak to that because I'm imagining some of the listeners would be curious about that. And that, of course, for many listeners, that would probably be the million dollar question. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, there's a couple different things in that. I totally agree. And I think the range that you laid out is even broader uh, in terms of staying in a toxic love relationship for circumstance, for insecurity, for whatever, that range is tremendous. But it's come down when to go forward. Well, let me put it in three different categories. So you can 
distance yourself from that individual and live life basically alone, but uh, shut down. You can address it uh, by going apart, divorce or whatever like that, and se uh, permanent separation, or some couples push through. And I don't think there's a pat answer for that. But what I do know is when I see people reach that intersection, oftentimes the question is, are you willing? Are you willing to own your own stuff? Are you willing to look inside? Are you willing to look at how we got here? Uh, keep in mind, if you've partnered up with someone at one point, you were gaga over the top in love with them total respect and admiration, overblown maybe, but nonetheless, you were there. And somehow you walked down this road to a place where you can't abide each other's company. How did we get there? And am I willing to continue or not? I know I divorced years ago in my first marriage, and it really did come down to that for me. Am I willing to stay in here? And at that point in that relationship, I, it was a firm answer inside me, no, I'm not willing. So I think reaching that place is a determining factor. And there's many different outcomes to that. But that in things. itself can take years. Yes, yeah. It took me six years to get to that place of saying, no, I'm not willing. And I don't think that's unusual. You know, it's interesting as, as, we, as we're having this conversation, I'm also thinking about, <clears throat> I've, I've just looked into, you know, what are the signs of toxic love? And it's quite interesting what's being said based on, you know, the conversation you and I've had, and I'm just, just looking at it at the moment. So um, this, this, the, the, the signs of a toxic relationship, lack of support, healthy relationships are based on mutual desire to see the others succeed in all areas of their life. I, I, I love that definition. Um, but toxic love would be toxic communication, envy or jealousy, controlling behaviors, resentment, dishonesty, patterns of disrespect, and negative financial behaviors. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we've pretty much covered most of that. Yeah. Uh, but that's the first time I've actually looked at that. It's a strange thing to say, but the work that I've done inside prison prison is one of the safest places i've ever been emotionally i have felt the safest inside a prison with inmates than i have anywhere else it's bizarre uh but the reason is because respect is a life and death issue you disrespect someone there are serious consequences. That culture, that environment does not tolerate disrespect. And the serious consequences, if you disrespect someone else, you risk dying. It's that simple. Now, if we take that level of respect and apply it to a relationship, if disrespect was had equal stigma in our relationships, would that motivate us to use contempt less? Well, it certainly would with me. If I knew it was life or death, if I showed contempt and instead of respect, that would influence my choices. Well, we're not in prison. You probably won't get stabbed but it's still life and death. Whether we choose respect and honesty and self-disclosure and self-awareness, or whether we use contempt and disrespect and, uh, and disregard others beneath consideration. If the consequences were that great, and they are, how much would that influence, you know, where we steer?
where common sense meets enlightenment. Conversations around mind, body, and spirit. Each month, a group of wellness thought leaders assemble to discuss topics like rage, wisdom in the 21st century, our mental chatter, and how to build healthy relationships.